Well, happy Friday, everybody. This is Main Street. And once again, this is not Gary Allen. Gary's doing just fine. We love you, Gary. Uh, I'll be with you today and next week and possibly the week after that. But please know that for the big fall push, Gary will be back hosting his own show. But just to make sure you don't go away, boy, do I have a guest for you today. I invited a friend of mine to come join us and play for an hour. He is an actor. He's a producer. He's a writer. He does tremendous work for charity, and he's been my friend for over 30 years. Would you please give a Main Street welcome to my buddy, Wesley Yor? Hey, hi, Jeffrey. Go good to see you, my friend. This is weird doing it this way, isn't it? I know. I, I feel like uh, I feel like we should be we should be at at, at Sherman's having deli, and, yes. and hopefully you'll pick up the tab. But oh no, <laughs> unbelievable! I have, listen. I, this is so much fun because uh, you know you and I just usually just sit in coffee and stuff and talk and talk and talk without without an audience. And I am such a fan of yours, and I'm so I'm so excited you're hosting these shows. I hope Gary's yeah. okay and everything's good. And uh, uh, so, well, I, he appreciates that, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate you. No, oh, I'm a fan. Listen, I'm. I, you know, we were talking right before we come on about you know, well, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to do? I said, look, you and I have done so many of these in our lifetime with your books and your performances and and my shows and stuff, and especially with the pandemic. I think I, you know. In the last year and a half, I think I've done so many podcasts and things. It's been, it's been, it's been so much fun. It's been extraordinary. So yeah, I, I've done in the last year and a half literally hundreds of video and audio podcasts and television stuff and radio stuff. Uh, this it's a new world being able to work from home. It is, but uh, and, and you know, and, and all my production I've been having because I've got a show in production that I'm executive producing, and it. It's amazing how what we can accomplish over Zoom. I don't know if we'll ever go back to uh, face to face again. Hey, right before we came on, we were talking about Wikipedia, and uh, it's a good story that my Wikipedia page got come. Somebody just wiped it out. Some some angry, jealous someone took my page down completely. Wow. What weird. happened to What happened to yours? Well, mine. A friend. I was doing a show. I was doing the Star Trek convention because. Land of the Lost was written by the Star Trek writers. So, right. so Kathy, who played Holly, and I go and do the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas at the Rio every year. And one of the guys I was sitting next to, Jeff, he's uh, the voice of, uh, of the Borg and, uh, on Star Trek, if you're fans. And he, he looked at my Wikipedia and said, you know, they've got your career here. And then they've got like a tabloid about, you know, your personal life and the ups and downs of it all. And he says, you know... That doesn't look good. He said, let me fix that. So he went in and and bless him. I mean, he went in and, and cleaned up all the the debris. As, you know, but it really did. It was like I never looked, I just never looked at Wikipedia and stuff like that for myself. No, no. And I, was, I, I never looked at mine until someone said it isn't there anymore. It's like Yeah, Ooh. it was actually it was like the National Enquirer, and I was going, Well, I thank you so much. Well, we've both been in the National Enquirer, but that's another conversation. It is. <laughs> Let's see. Well, another time, day. One time I was in the National Enquirer, and it was saying that uh, that Mackenzie Phillips was upset because I was dating her mother. Now, it wasn't true at all. Of course uh, not. I, I just done a movie with Valerie Bertinelli, so maybe that was the impetus of it, because uh, they were both you know, on one day at a time. And it it was, you know, I, I found it flattering. So <laughs> I love Mac. She is absolutely wonderful. Back in the day, I'll tell you, back in sort of when things were a tamer time back in Hollywood, there was a little group of us. We'd hang out like with, with Mackenzie and Linda Blair and June, uh, June Lockhart's daughter, Annie Lockhart. And sure. And, and, and Deborah Lee Scott. Oh, bless her heart. Yeah, I used to end up playing Password with her. Uh, as, as and brilliantly, sir, brilliantly. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. I have a hello for you. I have love for you. I oh, spoke I like to that. one of your mothers, <laughs> Rose, Rosemary Forsyth. You're kidding me. I talked to her yesterday. She said, oh, he's my son. Send him my love. Well, for uh, yeah, Rosemary was my mother on Days of Our Lives. I played Mike Horton, and she played Laura Horton. 
And you, uh, you went through a whole bunch of Laura's, but uh, we did. Susan right. Flannery, uh, 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 Susan Oliver. Right. So Rosemary says the next time both of us are in Los Angeles, a meal, the three of us. Oh, done. I, I, my, oh, I love this. You know, it's re it's weird. I've had so many days for our lives reunions lately. Um, I was having coffee the other day with Greg Marks, Greg, yeah. and he's one of the Marks brothers' grandson. And he was on Days of Our Lives. He played David Banning, but he was on after I left. So we never worked together. But recently, I got a phone call from the girl that played my girlfriend, Patty Weaver, on the show, oh. and his wife on the show afterwards, Patty Weaver, and said, "Look, Greg is in town. You've got to meet. We met. We just became great friends. And we're sitting around at coffee the other day and talking about Bill and Susan Hayes, and of course, the grand dam and you know of of, of Days of Our Lives." And we're talking and reminiscing. I said, well, let's call Bill Hayes right now. So I pick up the phone. I call Bill. He's like giggling like a little kid. He says, oh, my God, Susan, <laughs> Susan's in the garden. Let me go call her. And the four of us had the most amazing conversation. And so my Days of Our Lives family keeps circling and circling. And it's really nice. I must tell you, uh, not because I love you, but Days of Our Lives is the only soap I ever got into, I ever watched. I got into it in college because I got home from classes right at the hour days of our lives. And I have my lunch with you guys. And, uh, it was so well written and so well acted by respected people. It wasn't just a bunch of pretty people reading off of cue cards. It, there was real talent there all the way around behind the camera and in front of it. How did well, you get into it? Well, days of our lives, of course, you know, had the first, major movie star as a star was McDonald Carey and back when it started in the sixties. And I just auditioned for it and, and I got it. It was, I mean, it was nothing more glamorous than that. I had, I had moved to Hollywood. I'd been working at the American Shakespeare festival at Stratford, Connecticut, understudying Ariel and the Tempest. Then I did butt stop, uh, uh, butter. What did I do? Uh, 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 West side story in Bucks County. And I, I went to LA within a week and a half. I had my first TV series. And it was, a, I went to an open call and it was a series with Kay Ballard, who was the star, who I know you know him very well. Yours. And uh, I was the lead singer of a rock group called The Organic Vegetables. And it was a show that was produced by the guys that wrote The Monkees. So it was their next show and there was a writer's strike. It all dissolved. So that dissolved. And within, I started recording for Motown and as a, as a singer. And then within a few weeks, I auditioned for Days of Our Lives and got it. And then, a couple of weeks later, I auditioned for Land of the Lost, and I got that. So I ended up doing both series on NBC at once for three years. You were a busy boy. I was a lucky boy. I, I'm a little kid. From, listen, I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I mean, nobody in my family is in show business. We don't have a history. My, my family's were, family was all educators and college professors and things like that. So, mine, were all, mine were all drug addicts and thieves. They weren't in show business <laughs> either. Well, then I, may I say that your arc is higher than mine. <laughs> I, ra I raised the bar up, yes. I kind of started up here, at least. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a very colorful history, sir. I do, I do. Uh, the book is already written. We're just waiting for, I've got three, two books ahead of it. So when that chain goes down the line, uh, my, my memoir, which is called uh, The Devil Was Born in Brooklyn, will be coming out. Wow. And I and I tell all. Um, uh -oh. I, I leave nothing out. Yeah, I do not know you. I know. I never met him before. He does not know me. Nothing he say in book is yeah, true. You, you're in the book, my friend. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> but I adore you. There's nothing negative I could possibly find to say about you. Oh. You know, it's it, 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 as as we get at the tail end of our life, <laughs> at least my life, and uh, it, you, there's so much. I just turned seventy years old. And That's impossible. It's it's true. I just turned seventy, and it is certainly a time for reflection. And I look back now because you know there's certainly a different perspective that we have every year we get older, and how lucky and fortunate. And I, I have never taken this journey for granted at all. I oh, look no. around, you know I look around at what I have, and you know we all wish we had something maybe different or more or whatever. But boy, have I been a lucky kid and especially coming from my family. And I, I think that's something you and I share in common is, is we don't take the wonderful ride we're having for granted. We don't take the celebrity for granted. 
um, maybe that's why we're still celebrities. <laughs> because we're not arrogant about it. Well, I'm more at a Comic Con one of these autograph shows. I'm more of a beggar and pleader. <laughs> Here's my autograph. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, you know, we do the we do a lot of Comic Cons. I just did one in Atlanta, Dragon Con, did one in Connecticut, um, and we've got one in Pensacola coming up at Pensacon. But you know, we'll sit there, and I'm with usually with Kathy Coleman, who played Holly on Land of the Lost, and Phil Paley, who played Chaka, the Monkey Boy. And we're sitting there, and sometimes it's really slow and everything, and they're like, you know, somebody's grouchy. Oh, I wish we people were buying autographs more. And I said, wait a minute. I said, do you realize that every time you sign your name, that's four hours of minimum wage? And you, yep. just, you just go, okay, wait, just take a step back, what that means and how unreal that really is. And, you know, it, 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 it's... It, it's humbling to be honest. And sure. uh, yeah, but you know, we are, doing the, doing the, the, the shows and stuff like that, we meet the most amazing people that have, were fans when they were little kids of land of the lost. And, you know, they'll come to our table and share stories that just, we had, we had one guy who, who was crying. He's, he's in his fifties now. And obviously, and um, he said, listen, in, in, in between the, the second and third season of land of the lost, we lost our dad and our uncle came in. He said, my family was getting a divorce. He said, I was a little kid. My dad was leaving. I couldn't, I, I didn't think I could handle this. And I saw that you lost your dad and your uncle came in and your family survived. And he said, I know it sounds weird. He's, this guy is sobbing and he's saying, but it gave me the strength to get through that transition of my life. And you just never know when you do something because, you know, we, we act as we, we do our lines and leave and go do something else and don't really think about the ripple effect it has. Well, we've had so many incidences and there was there was a, there was a blind couple they were married and they came up to our table and kathy was there she has this long blonde hair still has long blonde hair and they met in blind school but they both had their sight back when they watched land of the lost and both lost it and they asked kathy could they touch her and her face and they go oh my god they're, they're crying and they're both sharing kathy's face and we had i think like something like a, a model of a slee stack <laughs> and they were feeling the slee stack and but they were remembering it was a shared experience that they both had when they had sight but we and and they're both crying and we're we're hugging and kissing and and you know it, it, it's an honor it's just i you know i've never taken this for granted the access that i've ever had and as a kid that I'm rambling like a banshee, Arnie. I just realized. No, 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 not, not at all. I, I, I was letting you to know. It was a wonderful story. I do want to tell our fans who are watching that both of us are in the middle of an enormous electrical uh, thunderstorm here. And it should one or the other of us lose our electricity, the other one will continue on the show finishing it. So I'm giving you fair warning, Wes, that if I lose, if I come down... Okay. I was not sent into the fifth dimension by Mr. Mr. Gaspilidix, whatever his name was, Mick Gaspilidix. But uh, if you, for Superman fans, you know who I'm talking about. But uh, in the desert, weather gets a little crazy sometimes. Well, we're in Palm Springs, and this is very unusual. So yes, it's, it is. It's gone from you know 107, 8, 10, whatever, and today it's cloudy, and that, and I'm hearing thunder for the first time in months and months. And months, months and months and months. Yeah. When you were working on Days of Our Lives, because we, we, we'll get we'll get back to Land of the Lost and, and everything else you do because you've done so many things. When you first started in the 70s, Days was still a half hour show or had it gone to an hour already? When I first started the first year, it was a half an hour show. And then the next year went to an hour. Because so Days, was, Days was the first color soap. It was the first half hour soap. Then it was the first hour soap. It was a real groundbreaker. It was it was it was amazing, you know. When I I, I was I got on Days of Our Lives playing my court, and, and then you know I, I auditioned for Land of the Lost, and and I and then David Merrick flew me to New York. He wanted me to star on Broadway to replace the guy starring in Candide. So I was there in a hotel room, and I got a call that hey, you got the job, at, you know, of Land of the Lost. And I was older, I was twenty, and and the character on Land of the Lost was sixteen. And I don't know if I want to play sixteen. Anyway, thank goodness I said yes. Yes. But but NBC let because they're both NBC shows, so they let me do both series. So in the morning, I, I got for three years, I got to do all my days of our live scenes. And of course, everybody in the cast hated me because I would run <laughs> in, do my scenes, leave, and then I would drive over over from Burbank to Hollywood and we'd film Land of the Lost. So in the morning, 
I'm crying that my girlfriend is leaving me and I'm having sexual problems. The mafia is after me. And in the afternoon, I'm going, run, Holly, run. There's the dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little schizophrenic, but I had the best job. How did you handle all the lines? How did you handle learning? Uh, you must have had to use some sort of teleprompter to help you. Never used a teleprompter. Never used a cue card. We, ha wow. visualized we actually had... We had those handwritten cue cards uh, for years and years. Uh, Bob Bowden, who became head of the sci-fi of the uh, game show network, yes. was a cue card guy. No on, kidding. Jay Swirl Live. So I met him when he was holding cue cards, and then he became, I, you know, I was trying to sell him shows in the future. But um, you know, McDonald Carey, I must say, as he got older, uh, you could, if you watch some of the old shows, he'd be talking and having a serious conversation, and then you'd hear him go. <laughs> they don't, and I, I understand from the cast of days now, they do not allow cue cards anymore. Good. I'm sure it's probably for cost, but. <laughs> <laughs> also, there's a whole lot less show now. There's a lot more commercials. Yeah. yeah, And, you know, it, it's an interesting, it's like you were talking about memorizing and it, it, it was so hard at first. Because you'd go in, and when we went to a half an hour, from an hour, half hour to an hour, sometimes I could have one page of dialogue or 30 pages of dialogue, you know. And and within about three or four years of, day, of Days of Our Lives, I don't know what it was, but it clicked in, and I didn't even read the script until I got in in the morning at 6 in the morning at NDC. And I could, within a half an hour, I had memorized the whole script that, of my line. And it was, like, terrifying. I would get there, and I'd go, how many... How many pages do I have today? Oh my God! How many pages? <laughs> ah, thirty. And uh, but I, I was always able to memorize it. But it, it, it's like a muscle. Just so you use that muscle. Yes, and, absolutely. I was the know. same way. I could I could read a script once or twice, and I have the whole thing memorized. You worked with some incredible actors on that show. Uh, McDonald certainly had the gravitas. I adored Frances Reed as an actor. She brought such heart. To that show uh, you know the the, the we're, we're geeking out here about days of our lives bear with us for just a moment <laughs> the original concept was a middle-aged couple the husband was a doctor their children and grandchildren in the hospital to which he was attached and it was conservative as years went by they really loosened up the storylines to include some very controversial things. And always it was Francis's character who was the first one to go, wait a minute, we need to change our attitude about this. She was the one who said, no, no, we're going to be accepting. No, no, people of color, yeah. Gay people, yes, bring them to my house. I really felt she was the heart of that show for a long, long time. And then the writers... I think lost track a little bit. I counted at one point before she had to quit because of health that the Alice character was a great, great, great grandmother. <laughs> and that great, great, great grandchild was already dating somebody because they had to keep bringing in new characters as actors came and went. Why did you leave the show? Well, I was starting, I, I was opening, I was headlining in Las Vegas. I was opening for Bill Cosby. <laughs> Don't blame me. Don't blame me. Um, and I was I was doing a lot of concerts, and um, there was a there was a bunch of reasons I wasn't aging. They thought I was staying too young. Another thing, I was becoming too successful in my concert work. They thought they would lose me. Um, but because at the time I had the largest guarantee on Days of Our Lives, I had even more than McDonald Carey days to work. And, right. Um, but yeah, my I my 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 Francis Reed. I've got a story about Francis. Please. Francis Reed, for Christmas, she was throwing a big Christmas party in Brentwood in her home. And I said, well, can, can, can I come help you? I'll help you decorate the tree and stuff. She said, oh, no, no, no. I don't do trees. It's a dramatic tradition because of World War II. I, I don't do it. I, I, I won't do a tree. And I said, oh, really? Okay. So I'm driving. To, I said, well, I'll come help you decorate and get ready for the party. And I'm, I have an old Ford pickup truck. I'm driving over Mulholland Drive, and this giant, giant tumbleweed comes rolling across Mulholland. Well, I pull my truck over. I grab this tumbleweed. I'm, I mean, it fills the whole back of my truck. It's so big. And I tie it. Fortunately, it had ropes, and I tied it there. And it was so powerful, the truck actually would swerve as I'm trying to get there. 
I went and got white lights and red ribbons and stuff like that. And I go to Francis' house. And I said, Francis, I got a Christmas tree for you. She says, I don't do Christmas trees. I go, Francis, it's a tumbleweed. So she goes, ah, well, put it out here in the patio. There was a, just a patio. <laughs> so I put it in the patio and I put these white lights and the red ribbons and I lit it up. She walked out, took one look at it. She says, I think you can bring it into the living room. <laughs> and I understand that she kept that tumbleweed and for a decade later she continued to use that tumbleweed as her christmas tree every year you told her it was a hanukkah bush <laughs> I, when i talked to bill i talked to bill hayes and susan seaport the other day he bill actually brought up the tumbleweed they are so, wonderful people bill and susan and i did a publicity tour together uh bill's book came out the same time my ethel merman book came out so we did um the palm springs book which they don't have anymore unfortunately we did the palm springs book festival together we did the los angeles book festival together a couple of other cities they're such delightful people to spend time with well, and he was 90, is it 96 and 96? he looks your age and you and look he, 50 and, and he's got a new storyline on days of our lives he was so excited he go oh my gosh after all these years i'm not i'm in my mid 90s and i've got a storyline because he's such a talented, as an actor, as a singer, and Susan also, so talented person. But they're persons. Take away the talent in the show business. They're such nice people. Oh, my God. I, we, Bill, Bill and Susan and I, were, we used to, I used to host a lot of telephones, especially for March of Dimes. But Bill and, I Susan, remember. Bill and Susan did one in Abilene, Texas every year. And this really rich family would, would fund it and underwrite it. And they would fly, a, send a private Learjet to Burbank Airport and we'd fly to Abilene. So one day we're, we, do the, we do the show, the, 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 the telethon in Abilene. We're flying back and there's a, we're in a Learjet. And a Learjet only has six seats. And, the, and there's the pilots with just a drape. Back, you know, it's a tiny little thing. It goes almost, right. almost out of space and then in. So one of the seats is a jump seat that faces backwards and it's the toilet. It's in, there's a drape <laughs> around it. You know, it's for emergencies only. So we're sitting there, Susan and Bill in the back, I'm sitting in front of them. And then this country Western comic comes and sits in and he's sitting facing me on the jump seat. And he goes, and he's, he lights up, cigarette starts to smoke. And Susan goes, excuse me. I would rather you not smoke, okay? So I go, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm so sorry. So he picks up a garbage can and he's blowing the smoke in the garbage can. And Susan said, excuse me, don't smoke. He goes, all right. Puts it, the cigarette out. A moment passes. He goes, where's the toilet in here? <laughs> and I go, well, you're sitting on it. It's a jump seat. You lift it up. There's a drape around here. And Susan's voice from the back of the leer goes, I'd rather you smoke. <laughs> bravo bravo what a wonderful story <laughs> we've had some amazing times together you know i always felt not always i felt in the last however many years of days i don't i don't watch it anymore because i don't recognize hardly anybody anymore but i always felt at the point where all the storylines were so multi-generational they should have rebooted it and made Bill Dr. Horton and made Susan grandma. Well, Bill said to me, he just said the other day, we have become the 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 Mac and Francis of the show. They are the the patriarchs and matriarchs. So it, it, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Land of the Lost. And now working for those people. <laughs> Is Marty Croft? Yes. You must have, I'm sure, several. Sid and Marty Croft, for those of you who are watching, produced a whole bunch of shows in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, I guess. Yeah. But mostly Saturday morning kid adventure shows that had oh, comedy Puff. relief and, and. Yeah, Puff and Stuff, Lidsville, uh, you know, uh, the Bugaloos. They did the Donnie and Marie show. Right. Uh, you know, they, they produced the Brady Bunch Hour. 
they did, you know, they were all over the place, those guys. I don't think they're taking bows for the Brady Bunch hour. <laughs> for the rest of them, they were they were excellent, well made shows. The producers were a little mashug, a little a little off the beam, but maybe that's why the shows were so good. Well, you know, Mar Marty is the business guy. He sits the creative guy. He was a he was the youngest puppeteer at the Barman Bailey Circus when he was seven years old, selling twenty five cent puppets on the sideshow. And he told you, as a kid, remember he's a little kid at the on the sideshow doing his puppet act and then selling these little puppets, paper puppets. And he said, don't open them till you get home. And the reason was they didn't work. <laughs> so, but Sid was a famous puppeteer. He opened for his act. He had a big puppet act. He opened for every at the every major star from Judy Garland, I mean, to Mae West, to everybody who did shows. Sid was an opening act. And then it morphed into after... The World's Fair, I think in 62, he had the pooper puppets, the puppery, the stripper puppets, they stripped. Yes. And it was this huge success that ran for years and years. And that's how they they broke into television. I, I've, told, I've, told I've told you, I've told you this. Yes, I've told you this story privately, but I'll, I'll share yes. it here for our friends and fans. Uh, the year I was nominated for a Grammy, there are parties all week long. Okay, okay. I love that. Okay, I love it. The year I was nominated for a Grammy. I, I did, did not puff on a cigarette. That's in your imagination. <laughs> That's such a great line. However, Opening line. I love it. The year I was nominated for a Grammy, there, there are parties all week long. One of them is a dinner and a presentation. They, they have a song, Hall of Fame. They, they bring songs like this is a Hall of Fame song now. And I brought Jack Carter as my date. Wow. So we sat Jack Carter, myself, Patty Andrews, Glenn Miller's kids, and Sid and Marty. We were all at a table together. And I get up, because it was, it was a buffet. I get up to get myself some food. And Sid and Marty together, they come up and you know surround me, one on each side, and together whisper to me, I'm so glad to see a Jew get nominated. And then just walk away. It's like, what? <laughs> what, what, what? Oh my God. I went back to the table. Everybody fell to the floor. What I saw, a complete non sequitur, you know, to, to, to follow someone off and then. But it's that kind of wacky humor that made their shows. Well, everybody for years, you know, would say, oh, Sid must have been high as a kite, you know, did drugs, puff and stuff. Lidsville, oh, Land sure. of the Lost, right? And oh no, 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 no. Well, finally, after the the movie with Will Ferrell came out, Land of the Lost, and bombed and stuff, where I, I was a surprise guest at Comic Con for Sid and Marty, and finally Sid said, "All right, all right, all right." I did inhale. <laughs> <laughs> he finally admitted to pump. But you know, I got Land of the Lost because. I got invited to his house for a for a, some friends of a, a, one of my best friends at the time. I mean, I'm just a kid. Is going to Sid's house for to go swimming, and I go to Sid's house. It was a Saturday, I think, and he, Sid took one look at me. He said, "You," he says, "You've got to call the casting director on Monday. I've got a new show, and you're right for it." And he gave me the casting director's name, and I called her, and I went in, and. Not to toot my own horn, not like I just got a Grammy nominated. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, but, but Sid said, you walked in and that was it. And, and they ended up casting the show around me because that's why the guy, Spencer Milligan, who played my dad, looked so much like me. And I, I auditioned everybody. And, you know, thank goodness. Well, I mean, what? And, and Sid, Sid will call me. I, uh, he has a podcast every Sunday. It's live on Instagram. And But he will call me. And I wouldn't say we talk. I listen for an hour but he tells the best stories i mean with michael jackson coming to his house and mama cass and you know all these people and you know debbie allen working on a new show with debbie allen and i'll be just it, it, it's to be able to call a man like that that genius a friend and to be just a little tiny piece of his his legacy is really or, not. or maybe a big piece because i think of all of the shows you've mentioned land of the lost was the most successful was and the longest running we ran and the longest three, running most kids shows ran for a uh, for a year i recently did uh, susan anton has a new show called idle chat and marty did it and johnny whitaker who's a great friend of yours yes uh, you know uh did it 
and Butch Patrick. And so I'm talking to Marty. And, you know, it's funny. It's funny. The, as we've gotten older, I'm no longer, you know, he's no longer the, the producer that I have to look up to. You know, we're, we're, we, we're kind of equals. Yeah. In, in our Your peers. Right. And I, I created a show on PBS called Dragon Tales, an animated series. And so I'm, I'm going to Marty and I go, Marty's mentioning something about puppets. I said, I said, Land of the Lost, didn't that run three years? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, Marty, my, my show Dragon Tales ran nine years on PBS. <laughs> he, he laughed so hard. He was like, rah, rah, rah. All right. So fill in something for me. I have been wondering about for years and another, another, Name drop and they have a drop. So you and I were at the TV Land Awards together because they were honoring Sid and Marty at the awards. Right now we're sitting with Butch Patrick and Johnny and some other people, and they have on stage a salute to Land of the Lost. I know. And you're sitting right there, and on stage is Barry Williams playing you. Why? Did you, you ever know, find I out? In this, well, because he had the, big, the bigger name, Q, at the time. I mean, he was more famous at the moment. But, you know, I sang the theme songs on Land of the Lost and the closing theme song also. And there I am. We've been, they told us to, I was, it, was, it was not a happy day. They asked us to come to Universal for this big event. They said, oh, you must dress up. It's a dressy affair. So we, you know, we had tuxes on and all that stuff. And as we're coming in with the paparazzi, they're starting to lead us up the back of Universal of the amphitheater and, and all the, the tables with food and everything's down there. on the floor. Wait, 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 I think we're supposed to go there. And they go, oh no. And we go all the way to the nosebleed seats, literally to the back of Universal. And they have all these Sid Morty Croft stars and everybody's there. And I'm going, what the hell? And then, and I'm angry. I'm thinking, well, why, why did you make me? And, and of course there's no cameras or anything like that, but, but, and everybody else is in jeans and shorts. And we're in tuxedos and go, what, why, what is this all about? And then they do this big Sid and Marty Croft and Barry Williams begins to sing the theme song to Lamp the Lost. And I am, before that, they actually played me singing the theme song yes. recorded from the series. And I'm sitting there listening to myself sing the theme song at the, at the, the amphitheater, sitting in the back row in my wrinkled tuxedo and thinking, why am I here? And uh, it was one of those moments, I got to tell you, I was like, it's, 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 it's the yin and yang of showbiz. You know, there's the highs and then there's the disappointment. Well, we, we were all doing the same thing. All, it happened to all of us. It was Butch Patrick, Kathy Garber, Johnny Whitaker, you, oh. me, and some other people. And we're sitting there like, why? And we're all in dinner clothes and diamonds and jewelry and sparkles. And well, that's just you. And that's just me. Yes. <laughs> Do you know that I wore a black and white sequined hat that night? I got offered two hundred dollars for it if I would just take it off and send it, sell it to somebody. Wow! I said, "You make it two fifty. It's yours because I want to make a profit on this." I wore, the, I wore. I had one of these. These well, the sleeve stack share from Land of the Lost. I had a, a some. I had just ordered a new one with a different pattern. I went to a Dodger game. I just took a a, a, a photo of myself at the Dodger game. Just, you know, I put on my Facebook, I got a, a message from this guy saying, hey, I want that shirt. I'll buy it from you if you'll sign it. I'll pay you $500. I go, are you nuts? He goes, I, he says, I want it. He wanted to frame it and put it in, in his pool room or something. So I, I signed so it. To him. So, bucks. so you silly boy, 200 bucks. <laughs> you but the wonderful button to it, I don't know if you'll remember this or not. They brought Don Rickles out to do a presentation, but we were in commercial and he's there because he was walking haltingly. So they didn't have him walk out. He was, the camera would find him there. And he looked up at us and you know, he knows who all of us are. And he just looked up at us and goes, Oh, you guys got fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jeffrey, I don't remember that. Oh my gosh. That's funny. And I mean, that's the point at which I think Butch said, I'm out of here. And I think most of us went to the, uh, the tents that have all the goodies and we were just like, yeah, you're going to do this to us. We took home like eight bags full of swag. Just like, yeah, well now we're going to rob you blind. Thank you so much. And you know, they called me the producer of the event, the TV land awards called twice to make sure I was coming. I was like, Kathy okay. borrowed Kathy Garber, who 
Sissy from Family Affair right. and many other things. Kathy borrowed like $10,000 worth of diamond earrings and a necklace and a bracelet to look glamorous. And I mean, we were on camera for a few seconds. They did come up at us. I don't know. At one, that at all. I don't at one point. No, just they, they went like, ah, and then back. That was it. That was the whole, uh, a robot camera came up at us. Oh, yeah. I did not. I, well, I missed that too. So that's. It was but a I, very strange Bill evening. Paley, Bill Paley played Chaka, had his soon to be wife, Marla, there. And, you know, he wasn't, at the time, he would work for a law firm and things were, bad, were, were very slow. It wasn't making a lot of money. But he had spent, bought Marla a new dress, had her hair done, her nails, the whole thing. He spent all this money, assuming, because they told us, come, you know, come dress to the nines. But anyway, listen, the fun was the fun was that we were all together up there. I, I, I do remember at one point, maybe it was when Barry was singing, and Butch Patrick had brought his son with him, you may remember. He's got a lovely young man. Yeah. And I just turned to his son and said, we're very big stars. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god jeffrey you know let's talk about your music you brought it up several times here and it's probably the one area in your career i'm not as familiar with uh, what is your genre of music what is it that you love to sing because you know like I'm, I'm a jazz singer what what do you do yeah I, I like broadway kind of stuff i like country you know my vegas act was a bad big act with girls and 47 costume changes they had five, they had 10 each, I had seven. Volcanoes erupting on stage. I had a big act back in the day. I got used to have equal billing with Cosby. And, um, if, but in fact, well, I, I attacked Cosby at one point. Good. Uh, yeah, well, no, it's, and it's <laughs> not what you think, but I had never, Jeffrey, I had never in my life done a nightclub act. Ever. I when I was when I was a young kid, I, I did a comedy act in, in Provincetown that was written by the guys that wrote the upstairs downstairs comedy material. So a girl and a guy, a girl and I sang a, a, a song about pigeons being the national bird, about saying goodbye to my friends because I had hepatitis. It was a comedy. We were the opening act for a, an act in, in P Town. But this was my first nightclub nightclub act. And I had never done it before. And I'm opening at Harrow's equal billings. We're sold out three thousand people. I've got seven costume changes. We've got the girls. So they call 15 minutes. The girls have to go up to a rigging. We had 22 piece orchestra and they were being flown in for the opening number because well, as one should. And I'm in my 1980s rhinestone tuxedo. And I haven't met Bill Cosby yet. And I'm terrified. I never, look, I'm saying this, I've never done this act before. I've never done an act in front of, I've never done it. I go knock on Bill's door. And he opens the door and he's in his jockey suit, he's got a cigar. And he goes, I go, hi, Mr. Cosby, I'm Wesley Ewer. He goes, yeah, I know who you are, coming in. So I go into his dressing room, he sits on his chair. <laughs> and remember, I'm in my rhinestones, all rhinestones. I get on my knees and I, look, I grab his legs and I look up at Bill and said, I'm so scared. <laughs> he starts to laugh. He said, let me tell you something. He said, when I did I Spy, he said, I'd never done TV before as a stand-up comic. He said, so every time something happened, I'd get scared. The light would blow or something, and, and Robert Culp, he would, take, he, would, he would explain it to me. He said, I'm going to take good care of you, so I will watch you, and I'll guide you through this journey. And sure enough, every night he watched my act, and when, when we finished the act, you know, it's a, applause, applause, goodbye, goodbye, exit with the girls. And then we have, you know, the big orchestra come 22 pieces. And ladies and gentlemen, Harris Hotel is proud to present Mr. Bill Cosby. And out he comes dragging his stool, jogging suit, cigar. And he goes, let's bring on Wesley's daughters. And it was the first time he had ever reintroduced introduced an act, an opening act. He'd never done it before. So the girls come out. And the audience is applauding and cheering and screaming. And that ladies and gentlemen, Wesley Ewer. And I come out. The audience is screaming. And in the middle of it, so imagine, there's 3,000 people screaming. He puts down the mic as if we're in a private room and goes, so how'd it go tonight? I go, well, I did what you told me. You told me to try that line differently. I, he goes, I know. I was watching you. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm Wesley. You <laughs> it was, it was, what happened in, was we've discovered in later years with Bill is uh, horrible and so disappointing uh, to say, it is. Least. but for me, he was, uh, 
he because he did not have a reputation of being the kindest man on the planet to work with no but, no, no but for me i guess i disarmed him or something when i just you know just grabbed his legs i don't think we can underestimate your incredible charm wes i really don't that just it's natural to you it's just it's who you are it's who you are. Hey, this is Main Street. I should have said this about 10 minutes ago. I'm Jeffrey Mark. We're filling in for Gary Allen, who's got some ouchies. Uh, he'll be back in a few weeks. My wonderful, wonderful guest is my dear friend of over 30 years, Wesley Yore. And uh, let's continue. You got to do that every once in a while in case people are tuning I in late. Yeah, I, I know. I hope Gary's doing okay. So, uh He's going to be fine. There's, there's nothing. I guess we should say this. What he's dealing with is no one's business, but it's nothing major. It's nothing life-threatening. It's it's not a disease. He just has to have some things done to his body, and they're being done, and he feels fine, and I talk to him during the week, and uh, there, there's nothing anyone has to be concerned about. He's just not camera-ready, and when he is, he'll be back, and I'll be sitting here watching. So, uh, good. What are you working on right now? Because you, you like me, you've always got something in the hopper. So what's what's going on now? Well, I, 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 I've, I've been working on a new ghost show, a reality show for three years. I'm executive producing. We, we have a documentary coming out. We have a deal. We have a deal with Sci-Fi Network. I can't tell you the title of it because it'll give away the secret of the show. But it's uh, it's been quite a ride with famous ghost hunters and scientists that I'm working with, developing new technologies uh, for ghost hunting and it's terrifying and exhilarating. So that's I, one, of the, one of the projects I'm working on. I now. was contacted before COVID hit us by producers who were doing a ghost show. I hope it wasn't you. Um, and they wanted to have me come on and talk about Desi Arnaz and have me help them find his spirit someplace. And I turned it down because I don't do anything about the Arnaz family without Lucy Arnaz's approval. And I contacted her much after. She said, oh, you should have done it. Make some money. I don't care. But uh, so if you want to go look for Lucy or Desi's ghost, have me on. I'll be happy to go with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a believer, actually, that there is life after. And uh, I don't know that I would use the word ghost specifically, but absolutely people's energy do show up. You know, I lost my partner two and a half years ago to cancer, Joel Kabik. And Joel visits me all the time. So I, I'm a big believer. Thank you. I love you too. I'm a big believer in these things. So I'm looking forward to seeing this show. You know, I, you know, Einstein once said that energy can't be destroyed or created. So it's got to go somewhere. So whatever that is. But I, when I, my mom was out here, I brought her to Palm Springs uh, and put her in assisted living the last years of her life. Yeah, I remember. And the last night of her life, it's about three in the morning and I'm staying with her in her room and she's totally out of it. And I'm, a, I'm at the foot of her bed. I put a chair at the foot of her bed. I'm massaging her feet and she's pretty much out of it. And, you know, it's, it's late. And, um, and suddenly I look and there's her mother, my grandmother, as clear as day. And I stand up. It was my mother, Nanny. I called her Nanny. And I looked up and I turned around and I made a full circle and I came and sat back on the chair and I said, I started laughing. I said, mom, your mother was just here. I think I want a movie of the week. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and my mother had died at that moment. Yeah. She was gone. And I got a phone call exactly at that moment. And it was my friend in Palm Springs. He said, your sister just called me. She, my sister was in Atlanta working on a movie. She was a production accountant. And she said, what just happened? Mother came to me to say goodbye. Now this is Atlanta, you know, it's three hours time difference. And it's exact at the moment that my mother passed away. My, my mother came to say goodbye to my sister and she called. So I, there's something there. I don't know what it is. You can label it however you want to label things. No, I, I'm a big believer. I was in bed one night sleeping and I just sat up in bed and went, oh my God, he's dead. And it was late at night here, but but the next day on the East Coast where he was. And I called our daughter, Julia, and I said, uh, Daddy just died. 
He said, what do you mean daddy just died? I'm at the hospital. I'm downstairs smoking a cigarette. I said, yeah, put the cigarette out and go back upstairs because daddy just died. Yeah, sure enough. Oh, geez. It's, it's the, amazing. What, you know, we know so little. We, we are such, we're, we're such infants in this journey. And at least in my, and, you know, I'm not trying to be religious or anything like that. But we're, we, we just know as, as, as a species so little. And we, there is a reason why it's called spirituality, because if you plug into the energies and the vibrations of that energy, that never goes away. Uh, I, like I said, I'm a big believer in it. I'll be a big fan of your show when it airs. And I, I wish you to break three legs with this show because it's well, right one, of the, one of the things we're doing is trying to prove it or disprove it. And this is not like one of these where, oh, there's a cold breeze. There's a ghost. No, this is really intense scientific work i'm not wearing it now but normally i wore i wore sparkles for you but normally i have a very thick heavy bracelet i wear on this arm very very i mean like it's so heavy i can barely get it on and barely get it off but let someone flirt with me let someone say something nasty to me the bracelet comes undone or will fall to the floor when my kids are over, my daughter and my grandsons are over, let's say we're having dinner and we're talking about him, the bracelet unlatches, flies in the air, and then lands on the floor. By, I mean, I haven't moved my arm. It just does its own thing to let us know that he's there. Wow. So, wow. I believe. I'm a believer. So Wouldn't, that be amazing, guess, uh, wouldn't that be amazing to capture that moment? If we do, if we ever do, I will give it to you to use in your show. Because yeah, I'm going to bring a film crew to your house, and we're going <laughs> to have a whole bevy of people cruising you. <laughs> All right. Is it on? Is it on? Ah, you're not his type. I'm sorry. Next. <laughs> I forget. My, 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 I have a 16-year-old grandson, and like many 16-year-olds, every once in a while they have a smart mouth. And he said something to me that was disrespectful. And I knew I could feel Joel with me. I just put my arm out like this and <laughs> waited. And the bracelet did its thing. I said, yeah, I think your other grandfather doesn't like what you just said. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, knowing you, knowing you, you're going to have it electronically wired with a button in your pocket. You can control no. it. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Not at all. How do you... My, my kids and grandchildren, you know, both of us, both Joel and I are celebrities. Joel was, and for those who don't know, and maybe you don't know, was a radio personality back east uh, for many, many years and, and did summer stock. And he was an actor and a singer and a dancer. My kids grew up with, you know, we have famous fathers. Just that's how it is. Uh, how do you deal with celebrity? Is, is it a happy place for you or is it ever a burden or is it just wonderful? It's wonderful. I mean, come on. I agree. I really hate, I mean, I, and I hate is a terrible word. I am so disappointed with so many performers that I know that try, oh, yeah, don't bother me. Or I, I, that was so long ago. I'm not that person anymore. And they, and they, how lucky. I mean, you know, I was able to, I, I've had like four or five TV series that have all been hits from my game shows that I've hosted for Nickelodeon to things like that and Dragon Tales and Land of the Lost Days of Our Lives. That's like kept capturing lightning in a bottle. And, and how lucky. I mean, it, I feel like the luckiest kid around. I mean, I just look around and go, you know, how the hell did I get here? See, you and, I, you and I feel exactly the same way. I met Joel when I was still 13. I was getting paid to be in show business when I was in fi I was 15. 13 and 15 and this long life we're still here we're still working how neat is that i i we sat down once julia and i trying to figure this out if you added up the books i've written and the people who've read them the tv shows i've done the singing i've done the stage shows i've done the nightclub work i've done the, this kind of stuff that i've done it's millions of people who have become aware of my talent many millions more of yours how can you not like that? How can you, how can anyone not go? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But you know, also forget, forget the, the actual fame of any of that stuff, the attention that's brought on, on us, the doors that it's open for me to meet the people that ha I have always been huge fans of. Sure. I mean, to be at a party with Jimmy Stewart and to be, you know, 
to, to be sitting at a table with, with people that, you know, I never in my life thought I would meet. And yet there I am. And we're talking as if we're old friends, that access, that's what, that's what to me is so startling. You know, it, it, the doors now you, because you've entered, you know, come on, you write these amazing books, celebrity books and, you know, and you know, Harlan Boyle. So, you know, you know, everybody <laughs> in the planet, right? Harlan, by the way, is one of the, the major uh, incredible publicists and has handled every major star on the planet, including, but, including you. And so it, it, it is truly, a, you know, it, it, the access, it's just, it, it's, it's just, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I was backstage with Lindsay Wagner two nights ago. Yes, you, you know, were. Having a chat with Lindsay Wagner, you know, bionic. <laughs> Isn't she nice? Oh my God. But just, but those kind of moments. We were at dinner, you and I, you were having a dinner party at Manhattan in the desert, which is a local Jewish deli here in the desert. And I happened to be in the restaurant by myself and you invited me to come join because we're longtime friends. And I guess your friends didn't really know who I was or didn't recognize me, which is fine. Not everybody knows who I am. And you introduced me by saying, this guy knows everybody in show business. And they started to laugh because look who's saying it. And then you started mentioning the people I know and you saw the, the mouths just begin to drop open. That's how you introduced me as this guy who knows everybody. You know, we've, we've got a game. It's, it's name dropping. It's how many names can we pick up? Every time we say somebody's favorite names, we have to pick up. We have to reach down and pick up, put, put it, you know, pick up names. And sometimes we'll be able to do it. Of course, it becomes funny then after a while, you know. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. Who are you going to name drop this time? And it's, you know. <laughs> but, the, you know, nobody gets angry at people for mentioning their coworkers at work or at the office or at the farm. We're talking about people we work with and play with because this is this is our arena. And, well, one of the uh, most one of the most terrifying moments I've had with a celebrity was I got uh, I became a regular uh, celebrity on Password, at which day. you were brilliant. By Thank the way, you. Thank you, Buzzer TV. I'm it's back on the air again. Yeah. So I remember I was a huge fan, game show fan. So I used to love Password with Alan Ludden, and they were doing Password Plus, and I got you know I'm twenty, I'm early twenties. And I'm thinking, you, you've got the job. You're going to be playing with a the celebrity. They don't tell you which celebrity you're playing with. So I'm thinking, please don't make it Elizabeth Montgomery. Please, because she's, I, I used to watch Password, and she was the most terrifying, wonderful player. So I drive into NBC, and they've given me Johnny Carson's parking spot because Ooh. it's the weekend. And they have over Johnny, because because Days of Our Lives was on the same line. Right. So I knew his parking spot. And they put my name across Johnny Carson's, right? And I'm pulling into Johnny's spot. They're going, and I look to my right and it says, Elizabeth Montgomery. <laughs> no, please, please. I was so intimidated by her. Come on, I mean, he's a huge fan, Bewitched and all that. And we ended up having this amazing rivalry for many, many episodes. They would bring me back because we, the two of us would, would, would pretty equal as, as far as gameplay. And Alan once said that she was the best female player and I was the best male player. And so we were pitted so much, but those kind of moments where you, where you actually are put in, in a professional situation with somebody that you have idolized your whole life. And that's just, I mean, just one of those moments, you know, of again, access. Well, but the access is brought in by your talent, your burning ambition, because we, we can't be where we are. And just be like a days ago. We 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 burn. We have ambition to achieve things with God given talent. And then there's that magic dust of luck. We've been very 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 lucky men, because there are people out there who I am sure are greatly talented, and for whatever reason, just never got anywhere in the business. Well, there's some people so much more talented than I am, and you know. I, again, we uh, we now we're doing a lot of these Comic Con shows. Everybody like I just did one and and. and Gil Gerard is sitting to my left and Lou Gossett Jr. is sitting to my right. I mean, you know, it's, and we get to play and laugh and giggle. But the thing that really bothers me circling back is that you'll see people from different casts that have been, that hate each other, that literally just can't, won't even sit at the same table that actually sometimes in their contracts say we, we're, we, we don't have to sit next to each other. Gee, but, I can't imagine who you're talking about. <laughs> we have secrets. We have secrets. Yes, but, we do. But not just that person you're thinking, but other cast members and people. And I have been so fortunate in my life for, for Land of the Lost with Kathy and Phil and, and all the cast. We are like brother and sister. And I've always said to the Crofts, because Kathy, I talk to her all the time, played my sister on Land of the Lost. 
and she is my sister. In fact, we'll do some shows and we'll actually bunk together. And I've always said, you know, Sid and Marty Croft didn't just cast my TV family, but they gave me a real life family that has long outlasted the show. And so I've been very lucky that, 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 that it's, you know, theater is an amazing place when you do a play that's instant family is, is, is for life becomes with this small group of people for these few months. And, and that happened for, for lifelong friendships that I have like yourself. I mean, that the business just seems to elicit and, and generate that kind of relationships. And that's one of the greatest joys of being in this business for me. You're talking about access. Uh, uh, we're almost running out of time here. If we run a little long, nobody will care. But uh, Don Wells, our, my dear Don Wells, we lost to COVID, threw a birthday party for me a few years ago. And it was a small little, literally a backyard barbecue around her pool. Peter and Lori Marshall, Barbara Eden and her husband, Dawn and her manager, Leonard, uh, Harlan Bull and his partner, my assistant and myself. That was the entire party. Wow. And we're having dinner, just just literally just, just, you know, potato salad and coleslaw and hot dogs and hamburgers. And Harlan and I, because Harlan, like you and I, has known everybody in show business forever. And Harlan and I start telling stories. And at one point, we look at each other and go, wait a minute. We've got Peter Marshall and Don Wells and Barbara Eden sitting here. Why are we telling stories, you guys? And they said, no, you you have better stories than we do. It was an amazing, and Harlan was like, we both said, we are the luckiest sons of bitches on this entire planet. I agree. Boy, um, can you imagine being around Marianne from Gilligan's Island swimming pool? I mean, come on. You know, and that's just, that's, 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 plus she was an amazing, amazing. Girl. Dawn and I were very, very, very close friends. Yeah. I stayed at her home very often and she'd knock on my door six o'clock in the morning. I don't do, I'm a nighttime guy. I'm a show business guy, theater person. Knock, 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 knock. Yeah. The coffee is ready. Get up. We're talking. And she'd be wearing just a t-shirt, a long t-shirt. And I get up in my boxer shorts and damn it, sit around her kitchen table, sipping coffee and talking about anything about which she was curious. It was a remark. She was a, a remarkable woman. I was so blessed to have her as a close friend. Well, you've, you've had relationships like this with a, a lot of very, very famous people more so than I have, uh, because you've had a lot more personal relationships like in her house. You know, I may know her casually, you know, her living with her. I mean, you know, but, but, the, and she's just one of many that I know that, you know, and have had these kind of intimate relationships that go well beyond, you know, a professional, you know, moment in time. I could write books about most of these people just from our personal conversations, but uh, I won't, but I could, I've been uh, again. I, and, and you, sir, you know, uh, let me give you a little, before we say good night here, you you and I met before I got clean and sober. I'm clean and sober 32 years. You and I met 33 or 34 years ago. You are an amazing, supportive friend. None, not that you'd have anything to be jealous of with me, but none of the competition, none of the just, hey, how can I help? Hey, I love you. Hey, what? how can we have fun? You're an amazing man, and I'm so proud to have you as a friend for so many years. Just wanted to say that publicly. Wow, thank you. That means that means a, a great deal. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I would marry you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't afford the ring. I'm telling you, no. Yes, I, ring. This is it. No. <laughs> I got a box full. We'll find one that fits. <laughs> yeah, I don't want the glass, Jeffrey. I want the real stuff. Okay. For you, baby, I'll come across. <laughs> I can't believe the hour is up. This has flown by. Is there anything you want to promote really quickly? Anything no, new coming right down the line? No, everything's everything's good. No, you know, it's like, go to go to my Facebook or, or Instagram or Twitter or something, and, and, and all the information, things that are coming up, you know. And and I look for you know I look forward to meeting people and, and hopefully. Uh, you know, plus, plus, as soon as we hang up, I'm sure we'll be talking and uh, and we'll set up a coffee. Well, we're going to have dinner Tuesday night. So there. Oh, that's right. Yes, I, I am. I am doing a Q&A for friends have a play called Electricity. It's been longest running play in Palm Springs. 
and I'm I'm going to do the Q and A, and I'm following in the footsteps of of like Ruta Lee and Jim J Bullock and all these amazing celebrities yeah. that have done this. Don Wells. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be doing it a few weeks out. So yeah. Oh, you are okay. Yeah. So you know, just so, one of the one of the little things we do. So one of the little things we do. By the way, if you happen to be in the desert, Electricity is a play, a two man play written by our friend Terry Ray, that is magnificent it is my favorite play and although he never knew the story of joel and me there is so much of joel and me in that play i've seen it six times i cry every time i brought our daughter julia to see it she cried there are whole paragraphs out of my life i don't know how terry did it but he put us into this play psychically right. yeah, so if you have a chance to go see electricity right please do yeah and, it, and it's it's basically you know it's it's same time next year it's it's two guys that meet in high school and it follows their whole life and what so happens. I can't believe we're out of time Wesley your I love you my friend and uh, Gary please feel better our wonderful Tom is our uh, guy who does all the electronics for us Tom thank you so much for making this happen. Uh, next time my guest is going to be the wonderful writer James Gavin who's written books about all kinds of people is a new book about George Michael coming out. We'll plug a Rama that. And James has wonderful stories to tell Wesley. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Gary. Feel better. This has been main street. And as I will always say to you folks, because I love you, God bless and have a happy. Uh -huh.